Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you that joined us a couple weeks ago for the website accessibility essentials training, um, the recording failed during that event. So I am re-recording that uh, training right now. So welcome, we are doing a session today on website accessibility essentials. And what you're seeing on your screen at the moment is the um, training.libraryswin.org website training page. And we have our post documentation on website accessibility essentials. Many libraries um, focus on accessibility of their physical building, a lot to do with Americans with Disabilities Act, making sure people can um, physically enter the building regardless of what mode of transport or physical abilities they have. Our website is our portal to our library um, resources on the internet. And many of you are interested in making your website as physically accessible to an individual as your physical building is. So today's session will be a long one. We are going to cover a swath of um, things that you that impact the access to your website. And we are going to look at some of the things that you have control over as a website manager, some of the things that you don't have direct control over, but may be changed and some things that until the internet continues to evolve a little bit more, we may just have to um, know that exists and continue to work towards a better web, um, access in the future. So what we are going to look at today, we are going to look at the principles of accessibility um, and some of our web page ac accessibility evaluation tools uh, so that you can go page by page through your website and discover what things may make your website more or less able to be interpreted um, by many different um, individuals using different tools. Uh, the principles of website structure, website readability, website navigate and navigation, how you get around your website um, from links to keyboard navigation, website and website features, which are some of those other elements on your website that make them look good, but may not be as, um, as well interpreted by machines that do the looking for menu bars. If you notice in this, um, a carrot indicates that a website manager has at least some control over this issue. There's some tools that you can use to make your website more accessible. Um, a star indicates that there are some things that can be covered by installing a simple plugin, which we will talk about today, that will give your website a lot more um, access, access tools for individuals. So again, the carrot is something that you at least have some structure, some control over. Um, and the star is something that the website accessibility plugin will help you with. So let's begin with looking at some of the principles of accessibility. And I really like this um, infographic that comes from WebAIM, which is one of our main resources for learning about website accessibility. So if we go and take a look at this um, infographic, we're going to work down this today, basically step by step. So starting here, we're going to start talking about the planning, the heading structure, the structure of your uh, of your website and how it reads on an order. We'll talk about, again, the readability, whether that, and, and then some of this is providing good colors and how you present text instead of images on your website. Navigation is this gold colored area down here. And finally, in this infographic, there is the extra things, the elements on our website that may or may not improve the access of our, um, or take extra consideration to improve access for your website. There, what's nice about this, again, this is a website that is very focused on website accessibility. They have a text version of the infographic. So while the infographic exists above, they have also laid it out in text so that a screen reader can very easily read um, all of the content out loud to an individual who cannot visually see um, that text or maybe finds this um, distracting or difficult to read for various reasons because there's more going on, a plain text version may be more accessible. So keep that in mind when you design a website is how that text interacts. This is linked on, um, on the training document 
and that will be available in the um, notes below. So our website ac accessibility evaluation tools, we have a list here. I am going to look today at um, demonstrate the WAVE by WebAIM. Again, WebAIM is the same one that created this infographic. And then we will look at the access scan um, from accessible.com. There are a couple other, um, well, there's a Chrome extension for developers that you can install on Chrome. And PageSpeed Insights is also a really interesting um, way to get at some more potential um, accessibility barriers. And then we're also going to look at the contrast checker when we start talking about contrast on your website and colorblindly Chrome extension. I am not today going to go into screen readers in detail other than to say, once again, a screen reader for those that haven't encountered one yet is a function on your computer that will read the screen narrative off to you. So it will look at the text on a screen and read it for those who cannot physically see a screen or have difficulty seeing a screen. So this is why it's really important because for, important for us to understand the structure behind our website because a screen reader interprets a website literally and by text and it needs guideposts along the way through structure through using text instead of images, through properly labeling what the different functions of the different links are in order to tell the person who is navigating your website where to click, what information is available, and um, how to find their way to the next thing on their website. A screen reader cannot read images. And we will talk about that later. That's really one of the key things is like we, a, a, a website is a very visual these days, a very visual interactive um, medium. Machines still, as of this point, and maybe with AI, this will change. Um, screens, screen re readers and other machines, including the Google bots and the Bing bots that crawl your website in order to return search results, cannot read the words on an image. They just see a blank. For them, an image is just a big blank piece of um, code on your website. So you need to make sure there is text on your website that even for your um, search results and for an individual using a screen reader to be able to um, understand the content of your website. So I will not go into um, the screen readers anymore other than there are three of them listed here that you can try. And then there's an entire um, tool list that if you really want to dive deep, um, this tool list <clears throat> will break down a lot of things for making, um, making websites, documents, source codes, applications, so many things on how you can test your, um, your software devices uh, against different um, accessibility uh, scans and tools, evaluation tools. That's your deep dive. But for today, we're gonna start right off the bat with the one thing that if you do this, you probably can take a deep breath and um, know that for anybody with at least some visual ability to interpret your website, somebody who's not dependent on a screen reader, this will make navigating your website customizable for your users. And we're gonna be talking about the Accessible WP Accessibility Toolbar plugin. So if you go no further today, sit this piece out, look at installing this plugin on your website and come back when you have more time to learn about more accessibility scans. So the Accessible WP Accessibility Toolbar plugin provides a toolbar up in the co top corner of your screen. And you see that I have it installed here on this website that will um, open a list of menu items that will improve an individual's ability to navigate your website if they have at least some visual, um, a visual uh, ability to see what is on your screen. So when I click on this toolbar, it gives me this entire uh, menu of options. And we're gonna go through each one of these today as far as what it does and how it improves. The, your website. I think the most uh, dramatic one is the ability to change your contrast. 
So for individuals that need a high contrast screen and be able to see these links pop out, just turning a toggling on and toggling off the contrast makes that um, immediately much more accessible for um, a low vision user. Somewhat related to that is the ability to increase the text so that now um, you have a large print version of your website available. Notice, however, there are some things that do not change. And it really depends on, um, the, for example, WordPress here, if it's in a numbered list, this suddenly is not something that um, the accessibility toolbar can interact with. And anything that's within this code box here is not going to change text. So it's not perfect, but it is an option. You can also decrease the text size. This might help it fit onto a smaller screen more easily, like if somebody is using a handheld device and you want to be able to get more things onto a single page. There's also the option to turn on readable fonts. For the most part, our websites are using a readable font, um, but some websites may use a script or a curly cue or something that um, for dyslexic or other visual um, uh, or low literacy, when you're um, talking about individuals who can't read script uh, because they haven't learned cursive, uh, you can click over to using a readable font and toggle that on and off. We're going to, when you look at marking titles, this comes also back to keyboard navigation, which we'll talk about in a minute, and highlighting. Let's do highlight links and buttons. This um, helps an individual navigate by identifying where the links are. So it's similar to what happened in under the contrast, where the links were highlighted, but highlighting links and buttons tells you where there is something to click. And again, this requires some amount of visual interaction with your website. This is not an audio, but you can see that all of these indicate now that these are links. And we'll understand in a minute why that's important um, for those things. The disable animations, uh, we don't generally promote a lot of animations on our websites, but animations can be distracting. Animations can, um, be for sensory uh, adaptation. If you have too much animation, you might not be able to focus on the content on your screen. The main animation that many of our websites have is that post slider on the front page, where it, for um, most of our, many of our websites, it is set up to automatically move those um, posts ahead. Using the disable animations will stop that post slider and give the individual the option to individually tab through those items. We'll, dis we'll demonstrate that in a minute. I don't have any animation on this page. Finally, keyboard navigation and mark titles. Keyboard navigation is important for an individual who can't use a mouse. We are pretty used in our world to be able to mouse, to hold a uh, device in our hand and move our cursor around. If you are not able to manipulate a mouse and you do not have a touch screen TV, a touch screen um, on your, you know, like a iPad or a monitor that does touch screen, keyboard navigation can be key for that individual. What is difficult about keyboard navigation is that many websites are not set up to show you where your um, where your cursor is. So I'm gonna show you right now, I'm gonna close out the accessibility toolbar and I'm gonna just demonstrate for you how I am moving around my website by tabbing. And notice, so it's hard to see where I'm at. Right now I'm tabbing through the top. I'm, I'm gonna back up right now. I'm on the main menu bar and it's highlighted my website link. Now I tab further and it brings me over to read aloud this page, which again is a screen reader piece. Um, enter immersive reader, add page to favorites. Now I have a, it's selecting over at the extensions and favorites. And this is how I would navigate. And the only other way to really know where I am is if you look at the very bottom of the screen, um, the website um, link information will pop up at the bottom of the screen for where you're at. But it's really hard to see. Now I'm gonna start jumping around, 
but I don't know where I am really on the screen. So all I'm doing is hitting the tab button to be able to move through the screen. Now, if I wanted to, I could hit enter at any of these times and move to that thing, but I don't know where I'm at. So if I come over here and I'm able to turn on keyboard navigation, what this does is it highlights the tabs. Oops, turned it off. I have to turn that back on. Sorry. Okay. Um, this highlights the link that is currently active. So if I were to, um, I guess I do need to leave that open. Sorry. Okay. If I do tab through here and click out, now I can see where the red box is, is highlighting which link is going to be active. And I can actually identify too, if I can go back and forth and identify when this is going to start jumping around to places on my screen that I don't necessarily expect it to go. Um, sometimes it goes straight down, but if I come back up here, it's most confusing when you start at the top. Here it's showing me I'm at the very top menu. But before that, it's tabbing around the very top of my screen. So highlighting the keyboard navigation is one of those tools that would help somebody who doesn't have the ability to just point and click at what they need. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more. But this, this accessibility toolbar, um, if this accessibility toolbar plugin is the one thing that will give a lot of your users a lot more control over accessing information on your website. I'm going to briefly demonstrate how to install this plugin. Again, this is the Accessible WP Accessibility Toolbar plugin. I'm just gonna copy that for my purposes right here. So I just hit Control C. Um, the instructions are also included here on how to install um, a plugin. But I'm going to go to the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. We haven't installed this plugin here. I am currently under plugins and add new plugin. I'm going to work quickly here because we've covered this in a couple other tutorials if you need the training. And I can come up to keyword and search plugins. I'm going to paste in the accessible WP accessibility toolbar. And I have my result here. See, it's the same little um, uh, man, woman, human navigation image. I will install. And while that, and then when that is installing, I will activate it. And now when I come to my front page of my website, I now have this home page with our little um, accessibility toolbar plugin over here. So now I can demonstrate because you see the um, Post slider is animated and it is moving through the different featured posts. I'm going to disable the animations here and that will stop what is happening on the, on the screen and you can click through individually to each post. And of course I stopped it when it was off. So I'm gonna stop it. And it's not, again, this is not the best not the most perfect solution. Um, you may not be able, the, the individual may lose some of this, but this is one of the things that we can at least offer for a person who is not wanting to see the extra animations on your website. Okay. So that, if you listen to nothing else today, you've learned to install the accessibility toolbar you can go to your website, install that, or send a help ticket to um, help at libraries or website help at libraryswin.org and ask us to install that on your website. Oh, okay. For those of you sticking around and wanting to do a deeper dive into website accessibility, we're going to talk about the structure, the um, contents of a website and the different features that we have and how all of this relates to accessibility. Back to our uh, website accessibility for designers, we are going to start with the structure of a website, the heading structure. Every website, whether it's designed well or not, has an underlining structure. The best websites are designed in an outline form 
so that you move from largest ideas down to the smallest ideas. This is like when you studied in school and you had to um, outline um, a, a chapter in a textbook. You start with the biggest ideas, you're heading one, your next idea is heading two, and your idea beneath that is heading three. Websites need this structure to ensure the logical reading order so that when a screen reader goes through it, it will read the contents in an order that makes sense to the listener. Visually, we can interpret information a lot more easily, but when it is being read by a machine, the machine needs to know where to go. So our heading structure looks something like this. Um, uh, when we plan a web page, we want to be making sure that we have this. So in the, the example given here is heading one is my favorite recipes, and then heading two are the quick and easy, easy recipes. The next heading two is some assembly required, so the more complicated recipes. And heading the next heading two is the is by far the most complicated recipes. So this web page is going to be broken down into um, types of categories of, of food preparation. And then the heading threes underneath here are um, different meals. And the heading four is a subset of tacos. So we have ha spaghetti, hamburgers, and tacos. And then the, there is another subset of beef tacos, chicken tacos, and fish tacos. So again, everything is broken down um, in, in categories and chunks of order. These H1, H2, H3 are our heading tags. And that is how the machine knows how to navigate through your website. It is going to read the heading tags in order that it is presented. So heading tags are found under the settings in any, basically any module that includes any kind of text option. There is um, under this, under the, you insert your module here, settings, area and then the design, we have the title heading level. There's heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, heading five, and heading six. Rarely will you probably get down to the point of using anything below a heading three. Heading four is maybe the most you'll ever see on your websites. Um, the, these are set by default in your, the design of them are in the, the um, Divi Builder or the Divi customizer, <clears throat> you can change what each of these look like. You still need to tag your information as a heading, but you can use the, um, the design to change what size it is, whether it's bold, whether it's underlined, italics, any of that. Um, always do that within that area. Do not use a heading a heading customized um, font style to just change what a paragraph of text looks like. If you have text in a paragraph and you want it to have, be bold or italics or larger font, again, come into the design tab and go under body text. Notice different from title text, go into body text, and here you can change everything about the font style of your paragraph text. This will be a visual change. Somebody on the front of, end of your website will see a visual change. They will not see all of the, um, they, won't, they won't know that it's a heading difference if it's read aloud. So that is important. The other thing is to use bullet points for unordered lists. So if it doesn't matter what order the information is presented in, use bullet points, use numbers for things that build, like one, first this, second this, third this. The computer will read that out loud and will say one item, two items. So if they're listed in order, use a numbered list. Again, by installing that or the Accessible WP plugin, you have covered much of this because now we have this mark titles option. And this will show a, somebody who is navigating your website where the key areas of focus are. So I have behind here, this is a heading. This is another heading with a subheading beneath it. So it is going to highlight anything that is marked with a heading for your person to be able to navigate 
visually more easily. Turn that off. When you're planning a website, this is an example. This is an example of a wireframe. Um, and for those of you that get confused on the back end of your website, this is called a wireframe. And this is a really good way for figuring out where your headings should be on, um, on a website because you have this structure here that you can actually put heading one, heading two underneath it for the machine and for, for navigating for yourself. But this is what in pre-planning a website, a wireframe might look like. Notice here, um, this is for uh, the Spooner Public uh, Memorial Library is doing a building campaign. And notice here that you have heading one, this is where the screen reader would begin reading. And then it'll read the text beneath it. Then it's gonna go down to heading two and read this information down here, and then jump back up to heading three to read the call to action information. So if you looked at this in a ordered, this is where it would read heading one, heading two, and then heading three in this order with the paragraph of text beneath it. But on the page, our eyes and our brains can figure out that this is more important. This is the next most important thing. And then this call to action, even though it's physically located in, um, above the heading two, our brains know that this is a heading three. This is the next piece of information. Um, and it's less important than the heading one and the heading two. Our brains can figure that out visually. If you have a machine reading it, it would just read across the page and it would read things out of order unless the headings were in the correct place. So this is why we want to make sure that we have our heading structure well designed on our pages. How do you know if your heading structure is right? So this is something that you can have some control over on your website. Um, depending on how your website was designed, you may find that there are structure errors. And we're going to look right now at an accessibility scan of, oops, let me turn these open here. We're gonna look at an accessibility scan of the Gilman Public Libraries website. This is not to criticize anybody's website. Um, many of these were built uh, and designed before we had full understanding and we're still learning about website accessibility. So you may very well find similar errors on your website. Um, I'm going to start over just so you can see. So we're going to go to wave.webaim.org and we're also going to go to accessible.com slash access scan. And again, these links are included in our accessibility tools here. We've got the wavewebaim.org and the accessible.com access scan information here. So beginning with our heading scan, I'm going to type in goldman.lib.wisconsin.us. So you would put in your website here and it is going to begin scanning that page. I'm going to do the same thing here, Kilman.lib.wisconsin.us, and it will begin scanning here. So let's start looking at our web aim report. This can be overwhelming to look at, um, to see all of these boxes up here popping up everywhere. Some of this are some of these are errors and some of these are informational. We'll walk through what some of these things are today. And just to note, there's always going to be errors in your header. That's pretty much going to be the rule right now. Divi is not particularly interested in making coding changes that address accessibility issues. We are working for future web page design on using some tools like child themes and other um, plugins that will give us a little bit more control over um, some of this mess up here in the top. Um, so for, for now, Focus on the content of your web page, so anything beneath your main menu bar. Um, but we will talk about some of the features here. So what this checks for is it's finding five errors, it's finding five contrast errors, which we'll talk about in a second, 17 alerts, seven feature um, things to be checked on. It's going to has 24 structural elements, which is what we're going to do next, and ARIA labels, which we'll talk about last. 
we're going to start with structure because that's what we were talking about. So it has identified that we have a header and that we have a navigation piece here. And so you see these symbols line up and if you click on them, it will make it flash and show you what it is it's indicating. Um, and it is telling us here, this is not an error. This is telling us that a navigation tag is present telling the um, screen reader that this is a navigation bar. And you can learn more by clicking on the reference and what it is and what it um, and how you manage it. And then it'll show you what the code looks like that it is referencing to get that information. Okay. What we are most interested in today, so let's see, let me turn off the code. Oh, I don't know. Um, minimize the code there. What we're most interested in is the things that you might have control over. And what I see right off the bat, and the access scan is actually a really good one for telling us this. When we come down to titles, it's going to give us an error. It's giving us a score of 61. The clickables are a score of 50. So these are areas that we probably should be focusing on. Um, the title is giving us an error saying that every page should include a single H1 title. And this, and so when we go in back to our um, heading structure, notice every page has one heading one. This list of recipes, one heading one, several heading twos. When I look at this website, we have what's happening as a heading one, summer reading program as a heading one, tell your library love story is a heading one, and get internet for less is a heading one. These should not be a heading one. These should be a subheading of what's happening. So, or, and actually probably should even have another heading in here that says, you know, so like we should have um, Gilman Public Library and then what's happening would be a heading two and then these would be heading threes. So you can dive into the back of your website on editing the home page and notice that what's happening, I went ahead and I added an H1 so I knew what it was and now I have my blog post. I can come in, edit the design, the title text of my blog post right now. So I'm gonna show you real slow here click on the gear icon. You can do this on any module that has any kind of text element. Click on the module settings. You have your blog pop up. The design button is where you have all of your text formatting under design. And we want to format that title text. We do not want it to be a heading one. For now, I'm going to change it to a heading two, although, as I said, I would probably add another heading in there to make the structure make more sense so that heading one, what's happening, would actually be a heading two, and then these would be a heading three. That would be my, my perfect fix. But for now, we're going to go with heading two. Um, if I wanted to retain, because notice when I do this, it's going. To, I might change the title text size. In this case, it doesn't look like it changed any too much at all. So I think we'll be okay. Um, but I may change the style, the style of my heading text just to make sure that that all matches. But then I hit the checkbox to save it. Update. Now, if I reload these two scans, all I have to do is hit refresh. And now I have heading one, heading two, heading two, heading two. And so if I come up to structure, I have all heading twos here, but I also have explore online resources as a heading two or explore new titles as a heading two and explore online resources. This is where I wanna come back and really think about my structure a little bit more. Um, but I have cleared this check mark where it says, now I've gone to a score of 100. So just with that one simple change, I went from a score of 67 to a score of 100. And now everything like this has been, um, there's still some things titles built as text tags should be labeled as headings for assistive technology, but they're neutral on that. Um, it's, there's some more information on that. But otherwise, just like that, I have cleared the title selection for this page. I'm 
make sure, uh, ensure a logical reading order is the next piece of website structure. So we're gonna be okay with this right now. Again, for me, I would still come back and make some changes um, just to make sure that there's a little better navigation, but we're getting into the nitpicky when there's bigger fish to fry. Let's look at order. So navigation order goes back to our keyboard function. So when we tab through our website using keyboard function, where does our mouse go? And this is going to show us what tab order happens when we click on our website. So um, let me view page. And I have not added the accessibility toolbar to this website yet, but uh, maybe I should do that real quick. Let's go to plugins. We can review how to install a plugin. If you weren't here for this earlier, um, one of the best plugins that will help your um, website become more accessible is this Accessible WP Accessibility Toolbar. We're going to install this on the Gilman web page. And now we can refresh this. And now we have our little navigation guy. If I come up to the keyboard navigation, and I come around my website, this is going to show me where I'm navigating one, two. And what's kind of cool about a screen reader is that this knows that there are sub items underneath here. So it will read that out loud and tell that it's a menu with drop downs. But notice as I tab through, I kind of get lost in here for a little bit. Um, there are some ex extra tabbing things with these arrows um, because of the scrolling uh, images. There are some links in there that indicate where a keyboard stop could be. We can turn that off and not have those navigation features in that. Um, now I'm tabbing through the catalog, search the catalog. Um, here's a challenge. I can't, I have the radio button for catalog, but that's it. I don't have another search thing and it's going to, this is an error that we're getting on the other one. All we have is catalog. Um, and that's a code issue. And that's not something that you probably can't fix unless you know more coding. Um, it's going to show you as we tab through here. So when I come back, you see that tabbing? This is the numbered sequence order that it is tabbing in. And there's some fun things happening where um, there are for 11, 12, 13, and 14, there are link one, link two, link three, link four, link five next. Um, and those aren't really taking us anywhere of much use. So there's some dead, dead air in there, so to speak of, so to speak. Not all of this is stuff you're going to be able to clean up. Um, a lot of this is built into the code and may just create situations, but um, it's good to know kind of where that tabbing is happening. And what is really cool is these carousels, the um, website or the catalog carousels actually have, are very highly accessible. They have really good tab features through them. You can see where the, where the cursor is, you can see what you're selecting. So this is something that has been well-coded and well-developed and is inserted into our um, page and we don't have to do anything about it. Love it. So those are examples of things that um, we're looking for more tools that are already built with accessibility in mind. Again, you may not be able to change a lot of this, but it is good to be aware of how your website structure and tabbing works. And when you come back over to your um, accessibility toolbar, both with the tabbing and then marking the titles, um, an individual and highlighting the links and buttons, an individual can more easily navigate um, where their cursor is on your website. So that's the logical reading order. And actually what I should also say about that is note that as you're tabbing through your website, it makes you stop and think, what is the most important thing on my website? What do I want people to see first? What do I want them, if they were tabbing through and not just scrolling down, um, what do I want them to see? And in this case, we're highlighting what's happening at the library. Second is exploring new titles. We have our structure happening here. Then we have our Explorer online resources. 
And then we have our tabs through, so it's a logical reading order. First thing they hit is Adventure Begins at Your Library, which is the newest piece on this website. Share your library love story, get internet for less. We have these other pieces that um, it will tab it through in, an, in a logical order. So again, thinking about your website and the flow and the logic and how many tabs or clicks it takes for a person to get to the information they're interested in. Okay, so that's website structure. Now we're gonna move into website readability. Readability is a visual piece, but it is also a machine piece because readability um, implies both the color choices and the visual palette that you're using, but it also involves the things that are visual that need to be made textual for a machine to read. So we're going to begin with providing good contrast on your website. Uh, we are starting as a, as a development team now, uh, when we design a new website, the first thing we do is, um, click, is select a color palette that has good readability contrast in there. And what do I mean by contrast? Um, as we saw with the access scan, high contrast maximizes the color differences so that they are most visually pop. They might have the most visual pop. It may not be the most artistic. It may not be the most um, graphically appealing, but it is the most readable. If you are, if you know about traffic, um, traffic sign design, yellow on black is the most readable. And so that's used for any kind of caution or warning signs in um, United States. Different colors have different meanings in other countries. <laughs> so I don't wanna do that too much, but the high contrast difference. Black on white is your highest contrast ratio. So we have the web aim resource, the contrast checker for, again from the web aim. And this is where you can put in any two colors and test their contrast. The hex value for black is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the hex value for white is F, 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 F. Hex values are what define colors on the internet. And when I put in a text foreground color of black on top of a white background, I get a contrast ratio of 21 to 1. This is, this is going to pass all of the tests. This is basically the highest contrast you can get. You can also pick some different colors from here. So let's say I actually want to do a black background. And we can start with white. Oops. And so again, we pass all of our tests with the 21 to 1 ratio. That's the highest one. Let's say I wanted to test that yellow theory. And let's see how bright a yellow we can find here. I don't have my yellow hex value, but I can actually show you another trick. Um, so there's a yellow. And here it's a pretty darn high contrast of the, of the yellow on the black, 18.8 to 1. Um, and you can adjust in here. I can because that's getting closer to white, you've lost your yellow. Uh, let's see. But then if I come in here and I get my, as I start, as I pull my color down, notice that I start to fail. Next thing for normal text, I fail on regular text here on the highest um, standard of AAA, but I'm still passing on the bold. And then I come down a little bit further and now I failed off on even the basic one as I get down. I believe the contrast ratio of is about 4.5 is your limit for a double A pass. So if you have a contrast ratio of 4.5, you'll get there. So when we set up a new website, we bring all of our colors in here to make sure that black, white, and then any alternative colors, we know what color text will have a high enough contrast ratio um, to pass these tests. So let's go back to our wave report. And we're going to come in here again. We had our summary. It reports five contrast errors. And when I click on contrast, 
it's actually going to give me a nice little um, color picker right here. In, and so we can test our uh, contrast right here. But let's see where our errors are. So right away at, up at the home, when you click on here, is saying this color on white is low contrast. Uh, let's pull up, let's see. Uh, okay, it's hard to see where, what is, what is coming to. You can see the little box here, the read more, very low contrast between text colors and backgrounds. So this light text color, this light, link color with read more is, uh, and you, when you click on that, oh, I don't actually want to read more, go back. Sorry about that. Um, when I hover over that, or I, or sorry, click on that one, it, pop, it pops up with the foreground color of that text um, right there as an error. And it will tell me what that color is. So I'm going to click on that error. It tells me 2EA, 3F2 is too low of contrast to be on a white background. So I could play with it here and be like, oh, OK, it starts to pass um, at 5. Or it starts to pass at this level. Or I could go a little bit darker and get it to AAA pass um, with my link color there. So then I have to decide whether that's enough contrast from these uh, center to decide if that's how I'm going to do it. To change that, you need to go into the Divi Builder um, or into the Divi Customizer, and you can change all of your links on your website to be a different color. So that would be a change we would make on the back end, and I can demonstrate that um, to anybody who is interested, or um, we can talk about that another time. But getting into the Divi Customizer is a little bit deeper. But what that would do is it replace every single one of these on your website, anything with a link would then have a darker contrast, and you would solve some of your you would solve all of your contrast issues basically in one go, save for your title bar. So that's contrast. The next thing we have on here is use true text instead of images of text, and this is what we harp on all the time. I am going to jump down here. So we talked about contrast and we talked about your website color palette. Um, again, we are going to be coming up with uh, color palettes for the future going forward and we, we will need to retrofit yours using true text and not images of text. This is one thing that people love to do is to throw a poster on a website and say, hey, good, I've, I've got my information out there. I am going to once again say a computer a machine cannot read this. This is a big empty box to that machine. This means that your searches, whether it be Bing, DuckDuckGo, Google, any of those, they are not, if somebody is searching for gardening near me in their um, search browser, you're not going to, your program is not going to show up in their search results because it can't be crawled you need to type this out in text. The other reason that this is not a great um, thing is images are, um, and posters are not gonna fit on a tiny little phone screen. So if somebody is, as I do, sitting at home, scrolling, looking for events on a library website, and all I get is this poster, I have to pinch and zoom and read out, trying to see the entire context when all I get is like one or two letters at a time. So for best practice, we need to have, in addition to images, we need to have the text. Images are still important. Pictures worth a thousand words, but we need to include alternative text, true text on all of our images. So if I come back here to our wave report and I come back to summary, I have five errors. And a lot of these are going to be um, alternative text errors. So this one has a linked image with alternative text. So alternative text is included, but there are some of these that have linked images right here is missing alternative text. So we have an image and it doesn't have any description of what it is. The good news is it does have digital library as a title and free eBooks and audiobooks on your device with a library card, but nowhere in here does it say Libby. 
So you may want to include in your alternative text Libby in order for the machine to read Libby, digital library, and audiobooks and or ebooks and audiobooks to give your person navigating who doesn't have the visual cue of Meet Libby or Novelist Plus, at least that comes down again in this in this title down here and Badger Link again, having an alternative text or at least saying null or saying it is just decorative and the important stuff is down here, that is going to um, increase your accessibility score by a lot. For more information on alternative text, we did an entire session on that and that is linked here in the notes. Finally, adequate font size. This is something that the, contra that the um, WebAIM plugin will take care of you for you is to increase the text size, which is great, large print website. Most of your websites have already been set up to have a larger than standard text size in the theme customizer. So this is the same place that you would come to change the link color. You can also change your, your basic standard text size, font size in here for both your body text and your header text. And what this does for header text is it starts at the 30 that is indicated here for heading one and then um, proportions that out down to heading six so that you have a decreasing text size down the way. So typography is set in the theme customizer. Um, of all of our websites, most of our websites are designed. I think the standard text size is 14. All of us are up at 16 for the most part. Um, and so we're already starting with a slightly larger than standard. Most of your webs websites should pass a font size test. And this talks a little bit more, and again, the accessibility toolbar, how that gives yet more control over that piece. Oh, okay. About halfway through, we've made it to website navigation. So we've talked about how the structure of our website works, how providing good contrast um, will, good contrast and um, text as an alternative to images. Uh, makes a website more readable, and frankly, just having good contrast makes your website more appealing. It just looks better. Now we're going to talk about website navigation. We've talked about the the tabbing as a function, but there, and then we've also talked about contrast for links. Let's go back and talk about navigating our website. <clears throat> WebAIM recommends making links distinguishable using more than just a color change. Um, a format, underline, bold, something that is a visual cue other than just that blue color that is kind of ubiquitous for, um, for website links. Sadly, WordPress and Divi don't really make this easy. I mentioned earlier that you can go into that theme customizer. So if we come back to our Western Taylor County and we go into appearance, and we go into customize or we go into Divi and we go into theme customizer, same thing, gets you to the same place. Now this brings up again, where we can change our font size, but we can also change, let's see, I always have to remember where this is, general settings, is it typography? And then down here, the body link color. Um, you can change that color. So we can go back to where we were failing out on this contrast. Let's see, this one here. Um, stop clicking on things. Okay, contrast. And now I got too much going on here. Doesn't like going back. Okay, so we click on this low contrast and we have the read more button is this. If I wanted to make sure I could change it to where it would pass both tests, I'm just going to bring it down and I'm going to have all of my links be this color. So I can just copy that color. Go into our customizer, I can change that out. That will darken that, publish. 
But what I cannot do is tell it to underline links, which is really kind of a shame. So there's only so much we can do with this. Now, when I refresh my wave report, there it is. Thinking, look, zero contrast errors. Yes. Now our, our links are all a darker color, but they're not underlined which is really too bad because we don't have that option in this WordPress to be able to do that. So this is again, where we fall back on that accessible WP plugin. If I come up here to here and I turn off the, inc the increase that and I um, highlight links and buttons, now it will show and it will automatically underline all of these links for our user. That's really the only option we have at this point. So that's covering some, here's some link errors. That's covering how the links look. There are some link errors. And this is one that I find is very common across uh, many websites in the way they were originally designed is um, redundant links. And let me see if I can get to suspicious links and redundant links. Um, we're gonna look at redundant links first. So we have a redundant link I mean, give me one that I can actually work with here. These modules um, have both a heading with a link and there's a, re a read more link. And this ends up being confusing because when a screen reader reads it, they're going to read this link out loud and they're going to read this link out loud, which is redundant, <laughs> exactly what the error says. So we don't need to have um, double links to different things. Um, here's another redundant link. And I, I wanna show you in this blurb module how to fix that fairly easily. So when I come into my editing my homepage, I'm gonna scroll down. So we are the digital library blurb. Again, this is a blurb module. The same principles apply to many other modules. Um, this blurb module down here with the digital library. Let me turn off. It's highlighting the link here, but what is also happening is this entire thing happens to be a link. And this happens with a lot of modules. So editing the home page, I'm gonna go slow on this. This is a blurb module. Again, it applies across some different module types. I'm gonna click on the module settings. It says title digital library. It gives us our text. Then I scroll down under content to link. Notice there is a title link URL and there's a module link URL. We only need one. So you can go into your website to any of these blur modules and fix this by only having one. The choice comes down to, turn off the accessibility too far. Do you want somebody to click on this entire module to go to where you're going or only on the digital library and not have anything else? Let me show you, I will adjust this. I will take out the title link on Libby and save that. And now for novelist, because we're getting the exact same error with novelist, I'm going to take out the module link and save that and update. Okay, we have our page. Now, notice I click on this anywhere, I, if I hover over the Meet Libby, anywhere in this box, my um, mouse turns into a clickable finger. If I come over here to Novelist, all of this is not clickable until you, the text is no longer clickable, only the top part is clickable. So this is really kind of up to you. Do you want the whole thing to be clickable? or do you just want the top part to be clickable? I think I am going to opt for the whole thing. So I'm going to come in to my Novelist Plus, to my link. I'm gonna take the title link out. I'm gonna put it under module link. So the entire module will be clickable. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for 
this internet speed test. I'm going to take out that link and I'm going to come down to Badger link under link again. I'm taking out the title link and leaving the module link and clicking update. Now notice I had 14 redundant links after updating, hit refresh. And now we only have 14 alerts. We have reduced it down from 14 to 10 redundant links. So I still have work to do in the blog area. And up here, um, there's some stuff in the header. Uh, it doesn't actually like having the home button and then having the uh, logo clickable. It doesn't like having these two in proximity to each other. It sees it as redundant. One option here would be to move the home button to the far side so that you have a home um, on the opposite bookending the logo or to remove the link on the logo. Uh, that would be the way you would want to fix that. Um, Let's look at suspicious link text. This may also be something that you don't have a lot of control over. What it defines as a suspicious link is like anytime you get a bunch of extra characters, I guess is the best way I can define it. So if you're doing like a Google form and it just spits out like this really long URL with a bunch of garbledygook and not a customized URL thing, it will post that as a suspicious link because it doesn't have readable text as part of it. Um, and so the link here is actually not that bad, but it includes numbers. And I think that's what really sets it off is it doesn't like numbers. It doesn't like extra slashes like or lots and lots and lots of dashes. So actually this, um, and, and this is gonna be hard. You, you need to look up at the suspicious link text error. And then um, if I move my mouse away, I can't, <laughs> I can't show, but down at the very bottom, it says um, gilman.lib.wi.us slash tell dash da your dash library dash love dash story. I think having all those words in the dashes um, make it feel like it's a suspicious link. So you may not be able to fix that and it may not be a real error. You can just ignore um, and know that you know better. So that's some things that you can do to fix links. So when we come back here, this is something that you have some control. The other thing you have control over is broken links. Um, the accessibility scanners are really good at picking up links that just don't work. And it will tell you that this is a broken link. And you can find links that maybe are outdated or anything and clean them up off your website using an accessibility scan. So broken links, suspicious links, and redundant links. We talked about the keyboard navigation. Again, this isn't something we have a lot of control over um, in, in our current setup with Divi and WordPress. Uh, this may be something that we can add with a child theme as we build new websites and re retrofit older websites or rebuild your website down the road. The best thing at this point is to include and to install the accessible WP plugin, and that will give you your keyboard navigation option. Whew. Okay, this is a big one. ARIA errors, navigation. ARIA is a really difficult thing for me to wrap my brain around. So I am going to assume that it's gonna be somewhat difficult for you to wrap your brain around and even more difficult to figure out how to fix it. In which case, there are many cases where I, the easy thing is to say you can't. Um, this, is, this is some of the back end coding issues. Let's, let's talk about what ARIA is. ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Application is what it stands for. The short version of it is it communicates the role of a link or the role of an element on your website. Example, an ARIA link would say, shop new titles, role, button. So this would tell your screen reader, your machine reading on the back end that this shop new titles is a button, it, a button with a link. 
And visually, we see the button. Visually, we can navigate to the button. But what that tells somebody who is not able to see it is that there is a link here with important information and that role is to be a button. And when I click on it, in this case, it brings me down the page to the new titles heading. Kind of the same with online resources. This would say role button on the back end. An interesting thing that I found is that it also really wants you to label a blurb as a role of a button. Even though to us, we have a picture, we have um, a heading and we have text in this blurb module. In function, the entire thing is functioning as a button. And the ARIA um, accessibility scan really wants the ARIA label there to say, the purpose of this is, to, is a button, a visual button that is gonna take you to a new location. And in fact, what it really wants is to say, is it going to open it in the same page, in the same tab, or is it going to open up in a new tab so that if you're trying to, if you're not able to see your screen and a new page opens up, it's gonna be in a new tab and you might be tabbing around keyboarding and listening to it and you're like, but I don't hear anything new. This isn't the new page. An ARIA label would say, roll, button, link, new tab, or something similar. Each, each screen reader is a little bit different and I may not know exactly, but it would give an audio interpretation of how this link is going to function. So when I come back to my wave report, and I see these um, uh, da, 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 ARIA labels here. They're the purple ones. Um, it's going to give me errors and say that it doesn't know what the function of some of these things are. I actually don't have as many ARIA labels uh, errors on this page, which is really good. One ARIA error here is that this one just says that an ARIA row state or property is present. That means that it is saying on the back end in the code what the purpose of that um, search box is. If I go into the access scan, um, if I can find the right place. Da -da -da. Navigation. Sometimes they, these, they put these into different places. Let's see. So here is where elements with button functionality should be tagged for assistant uh, for assistive technology. Um, this is going to show you the places that don't have an ARIA label. And then the one successful element that we actually have um, is for the search bar, which I was just saying, like search bar button. It actually has ARIA hidden true. So it's not saying it, but the role image and the data icon is search. So it's, it's telling what the purpose of this element is. So as we saw in the WAVE report, this says it's a successful ARIA um, labeling of that. There's another ARIA role stator property is present up in our um, heading. Again, that's not an error, that is actually a success. The access scan is saying that there are quite a few places where we really do need some better, like the next um, active controls, a bunch. So reference to a, this is a null reference. Uh, this is a little confusing. I can explain it better in um, some different contexts. But if we, uh, here's the best way to describe it on Western Taylor County. When you click on about, um, Actually, which, which one was it? Resources? Oh, okay, it's not any of these. Um, sometimes your menu itself doesn't have any uh, direction here and you want it all under the drop down. So if you were to click here, it would be a uh, null link. And it doesn't necessarily like that in um, the back end. But there are some, some references that are that they would like um, to have a role uh, assigned to. Some of it you can fix, some of it you can't, uh, and some of it we will be able to, um, and especially in a blurb module, uh, you can, uh, there, what we're going to be doing is installing this Divi Supreme Pro plugin on all of your websites. And once that is in, under the advanced features, 
you can add this custom attribute and the role equals button, you will be able to do this once we get this Supreme Pro module or Supreme Pro uh, plugin added to your website. So this is coming. This is one thing that you will be able to do in the future. Um, and here are some other attribute, missing attributes that you can add. This does require a little bit, it's not coding per se, but it's understanding what the coding is asking for in order to be able to assign those ARIA labels. Okay, Whew. so that's, um, oh, the final thing under, that didn't come up as an error per se on our thing, but the ensure link text makes sense on its own. Click here is pretty generic. Click here for what? If you can't see the thing, and, and unfortunately, this is one of those things like every single of our web pages, if you have a post slider, the default is here's your summer reading program. Click here. That's not descriptive enough to say what it is that the role of that link is. Read more is a little bit better if it's been reading um, this content. Uh, what I don't necessarily like or take more or continue is unfortunately with a blog, you can't really uh, customize each individual. You can't say read more about our summer reading program, read more about how to tell us your library love story, read more about getting internet for less. You can't do that within a blog, but um, you can do it in more of your um, buttons that you have control over. So uh, you could do, you know, like online resources is a description of what this button is leaning, leading towards. Um, shop new titles rather than click here. What am I clicking to see? Um, but you're like if there was a heading here and it said, um, you know, read more or find new titles at your library and then just said click here, that's not a descriptive enough. This shopping new titles is a better description. So just avoiding the generic button terminology that Divi gives you and um, classing it up a little bit. Does, okay, our final piece is other website stuff. Um, these are things that we have a little bit of control over and maybe not a whole lot in some cases other than careful selection of the tools we use. Um, we talked very briefly about this earlier, is that beyond our Divi elements, we can add other features to our websites. Um, one example of that is our website carousels. And so this is added through a code. Talkify calendar is another really good example of this. Actually, any calendar is a really good example of this. These are additional things that aren't Divi native that we add as a feature to our website. Our website carousels, are accessible. We, we looked at the tabbing through it. The coding on the back end does interact well with the screen reader. These are accessible features and we're happy to add them to websites. A Talkify calendar can also be tabbed through and has uh, um, the accessible coding. Uh, we're looking at a couple other calendars and we're working on selecting calendars that have um, accessibility in, built in to them. So the main thing and the main takeaway here is widgets, plugins, and other stuff that we add is to try to make sure that we don't use, um, we don't intentionally use when we have an alternative, a feature that is not natively accessible. Meta slider is uh, one that used to be very common. We've replaced it with a post slider in most cases. Um, I believe the meta slider, unless they've, they've done some updates, but uh, they had limited ability to be for responsive design. It wouldn't fit on a phone very well or on a tablet. Um, and then there's some accessibility features that are missing from that. That's a harder one to gauge. Um, and in some cases, you just need to work with it and find out that it's not accessible through a scan. Website animation. Um, we don't, the main thing you can do here is not use a lot of it. Um, there are a couple of plugins and modules that try to jazz up your website with things moving around. Um, and a couple of websites, I should probably have pulled up one, um, just lots of things moving on them. And that can be very distracting and difficult. And again, this accessibility a toolbar allows um, you to uh, disable animations. 
Um, downside to that one is obviously it doesn't, sometimes it disables the animation so much that you can't even get to the link. Um, and you also can't take it to another website. You have to install it. So you can't go to a website that has a lot of animations and apply that feature. Using color to convey information. Um, this is, we're looking at um, one of the calendars, or booking uh, features that uh, that we're looking at for Winding Rivers libraries. Um, very excellent program through their Vega um, that looks like it will be a very neat uh, booking feature for uh, that goes along with their Discovery Layer and Polaris. However, here's an ir irony is that the room availability for booking is indicated by green if it's available I think it's light green if it's, I can't remember if it's time that's generally available, light green if it's available to be booked and red if it's not available. Well, guess what? If you're red, green, colorblind, that if you didn't have words on that, if it didn't say available, unavailable to help um, interpret that, if you use color alone, you're not going to be able to um, navigate and interact with the website. Uh, one, there, the colorblindly Chrome extension is, when it works, a neat tool. I'll try to use an example here. So I've installed this extension on my um, browser, and I found that you often need to shut it down and start it again. It goes stale. So we're going to see if it even works right now because I have I've had it open for a few minutes. So colorblindly is our Chrome extension, and right now it's showing us the normal website. If I were green blind. Now notice, this is what a green blind individual would see. Dibby, 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 Libby turns into sort of a bland grayish color. Novelist really gets washed out. Our pink buttons go all green. And if you are trying to navigate basically by anything that's indicated strictly by color, uh, or if you had red weak, the, co the colors just don't pop. So you might not see the contrast and it would be um, more important to have um, the high contrast option. Here is a red blind option, uh, blue blind. Uh, now you can't navigate by a blue green color, but so this is a nice extension to um, bring your website up in, in Chrome and take a look and see, are there places where a person with a color blindness of some form would not be able to navigate your website because it is indicated only by color and not by words. So color and words working together. Finally, accessible form controls. This is another one where you only have so much control over this, but it is important to uh, be aware of it. An example of an accessible form or a form on a website is anytime you have people indicating that they that are entering information. So on the training.libraryswin.org website, they're right off the bat is send in a help ticket. And each one of these is an accessible form, it is a form control. And this needs to tell an individual audibly what the information that needs to be connect, entered into the form piece. So if you just have a blank and it doesn't tell you what to put in, or if I like this because it's integrated into the actual form field and you type in, but again, being more specific with what needs to be entered in here. So name is pretty well understood. Email address is pretty clear. Your library or website that we're talking about. Tell us how we can help rather than just text. Tell us how we can help write your message here. Make that form content more descriptive and it's going to help more people. Like another thing that here is the search bar up top, rather than just saying search or search this website, use something a little more descriptive. Like, are you confused? Are you looking for answers? You can start your search here um, or search this website, search this training website versus search the internet or search, so what, what are your parameters? 
uh, what is the search, search the catalog versus search the website, being very clear with what is expected to be entered into these form fields. Um, where you don't always have control over this is sometimes we uh, have in integrations for newsletters or campaigns and we get the code directly from that plugin or that um, third party. And we may not have control over this where it just says email address, first name, last name. That's fine. Um, but I think it's also very interesting that here that the asterisk indicates a required field. But when, um, when a screen reader reads it, it does not read is a required field. So if you want that, I would almost go back into my form on my training website and say name required, email address required, so that you can't, so you know that you can't enter a form unless this field is filled in. Again, we may not have control over some of these things. Some of these features are the code that we get and um, life isn't gonna be perfect. Oh, we've made it down our list. Welcome to um, website uh, man or website design and for, with accessibility in mind. Again, this is a great infographic to kind of check down through and see if you understand. How do we get to 100% on our results? In many cases, you won't. Um, there, it, we as a team, um, the website learning group, or accessibility learning group, the website um, design team, we are still learning a lot about website accessibility. We're not necessarily users of the accessibility tools on a regular basis. We need feedback from people who do use screen readers and other tools in order to <coughs> excuse me, engage with our website. We do have a link to a Google Doc here that includes some more information and um, is updated with kind of our evolving understanding and knowledge. I think we can get very high on our scores. Remember back here with the access scan where we went from um, a, you know, above average score to 100% with one simple change. So you can get a lot of things that um, you can focus on. Um, interactive elements in navigatable by keyboard. Maybe you can fix that. Maybe we can use a plugin. So you can work through some of these on your own. And then um, we will work on the back end on the design and the coding to see how much further we can get. So again, if you're interested, here is um, a, an evolving documentation piece that we are working on constantly. And um, if you're interested in specific things to your website, you can email website help at libraryswin.org and uh, give us your question and we can see if we can address something on your website. We're not in the we're not in a position right now to offer complete website redesigns um, as we have quite a few websites that we are in the process of building but we are learning more every day and um, we may be able to learn more about retrofitting websites, um, the plugin pieces and getting us closer to the website accessibility goal. Thank you for hanging with us. If you've made it this far, um, I'm sure that your head is swimming and that you would like to uh, tackle your website and get into some things. So I'll let you go with this for now. We may take some deeper dives um, and watch for future website training opportunities on theme customizer and some of the other backend pieces that are necessary um, to get your website more accessible and um, also just hang, you know, like continue to learn yourself. And as you learn things, if you encounter things, if you practice with a screen reader and find, ask questions about things, please send them our way. We're always interested in learning about website accessibility too. Um, and making our websites as accessible as we try to make our physical library buildings. Thank you. And I, again, this will be uh, in the notes below. You will find um, links to these uh, links to this training page and um, links to some of the other resources on here. And we should also have it tagged uh, so you can come back and look at a specific feature and work through this step by step. Congratulations on um, your commitment to website accessibility, and we look forward to learning together. Thank you.